Okay, so as I was saying, uh, I'm going to talk about playground complexity. How can we learn things uh, about complexity by looking at children playing uh, a little game on a park? And the motivation for this game is that it's still in the sciences of complexity. The big question that we don't know the answer for is how can you connect local interactions with emergent patterns that don't have any, any logical connection between them? So if you see the local rules, uh, you see the emergent patterns in nature, you will go like, how can this be connected? We usually get very perplexed about these things. And for the goal of explaining uh, some of the notions that we use in, in complex systems to try and explain what links the local rules to the emergent patterns, I want you to meet Amanda. Um, she's a 17-year-old girl, and she's going to be playing a game like you were playing before. It's a different game, but it's also a card game. Uh, as you can see, she has a blue uh, card and a pink card. And at every turn of the game, she has to choose which card to play, and she's going to decide that on the basis of what she's showing at, at the present time and what her neighbors are showing, okay? So she's one of 15 children who are playing this game today, and here are the rest of them. And they are arranged in a circle, and actually the way the circle is constructed is that every, every child in the game is looking outside the circle. And what this means is that no player in this game can actually see the whole circle. They can only see a few neighbors around them, okay? And also, another thing that is happening here is that we have 15 kids, okay? And because we have 15 kids, and this is a not number, uh, whatever choice they make at the beginning for their cards, there will always be a majority, okay? In this case, we have eight kids showing a blue card and seven kids showing a pink card, okay? So now I'm going to run a little screen so that children cannot hear us. I'm going to tell you a little secret. <laughs> so... The, the end of this game is that actually by taking turns and looking at the neighbors, every child in the game ends up showing the same kind of card, the same color. And we want that color to correspond to whatever was in the majority at the, ga of the, ga at the, at the beginning of the game. Um, because they have to only rely on what some neighbors are doing, we need to figure out how to actually tell them what to do. Okay? So how can we figure this out? We are not sure yet. But we have the help of some mathematicians who have told us that, okay, if you want to play this game, your player is in the middle and they have to consider what is happening to the three neighbors on the left and the three neighbors on the right. That is sufficient. So two is too little, four is too much, and then uh, three is just enough. So in this case, we have the player is showing blue and everyone around them is showing blue. And therefore, what they do afterwards is to remain blue. The thing is that if you uh, describe the rule that way, you have lots of combinations to take care of. So there are many situations a, a child can find it's, uh, himself or herself to be. So there are 128 possible combinations. No child is gonna want to play that game. No child is gonna want to have, uh, to look at a catalog of 128 combinations and go like, oh, what do I do next? And so it's complicated. <laughs> so we need to find a way to simplify this, this description of the rule, and we still need to find a rule that actually does the job, okay? So we can go back to, to this. What I want to do now is that instead of keeping the circle like this, I'm just going to make it into a line for il illustrative purposes. And for you not to forget that it's still a circle, I have this phone line. So they're connected. So Amanda can actually call Tiago and ask what is happening on the other side. So there is still a circle. So a friend of mine uh, pointed out that this local neighborhood that I showed you before consists of a player and three neighbors to one side and three to the other. That is seven kids. This is a odd number again. That means that in every situation uh, a child finds himself or herself to be, there's always a local majority. So why don't we go with that? So you check what your local majority is, and you go with that. And I said, well, it probably is not going to work, but I think it's probably helpful to show what happens. So I'm going to show you what happens. And let's assume that the arrangement of the children at the beginning of the game is that half of the circle is pink and half of the circle is blue. Okay? And then in the middle, dividing the two halves, we, ha we have Matilde and Olivia. So what Matilda is going to do is to check, okay, my three neighbors to my right are pink, and I'm pink, so the local majority is pink, I remain pink. Then for Olivia, she's going to be blue, and the majority of, of her neighbors are blue also, so the local majority is blue. What happens? They stay blue forever. So that means that the half that starts with Matilde won't be able to ever communicate with the half that starts with Olivia. And therefore, this is violating one of the main things that we see in complex systems in the dynamics that link local rules to uh, collective patterns, which is self-organization. The ability of use, using neighborhood uh, relationships to actually speak to the, the other parts of the network uh, over time and over dynamics. 
So yeah, we have this, this problem. We need an, another rule. So our mathematician friends uh, figured out back in 1978 a prescription for all the 128 possible combinations that actually does the job. And we still had the problem of describing this to the kids without boring them. So we actually found a way of describing the game. And the description is very simple. If you're blue, you look to your immediate neighbor to the right and your third neighbor on the, on the right. If they're pink, you change to pink. If you are pink, you will look to your immediate neighbor to the left and third neighbor to the left. If they're blue, you change to blue. Otherwise, you keep your card the same, OK? Now, if we go back to the initial uh, uh, arrangement that we had at the beginning of the game, this is what they look like. And if we allow them to follow that rule one time, this is what the network, network looks like after one turn of the game. And then if we allow the game to unfold, this is what happens, OK? This is doing something funny. Uh, so what we see here is that uh, three different uh, mesoscopic patterns, and mesoscopic uh, because they are patterns that we observe in subgroups of uh, kids in the network uh, emerge. So we have one pattern that is all pinks, one pattern that is all blues, and this funny checkerboard thing. And there is a nice interpretation for each one of these patterns. Uh, for the pink one, it, be it, it means that some people believe the, the majority is pink. For the blue, some believe that the majority is blue. And this thing in the middle is actually saying, I don't know what's going on. Okay. <clears throat> so how do these things emerge? Um, okay. So when we have a collision of pink coming from this side and blue coming from this side, the collision actually creates this I don't know sort of pattern. And as long as on, on one side of this pattern you, ha you have pink and on the other you have blue, the I don't know pattern will keep just propagating. The thing is that at some point here, you don't have more pinks on this side, and then the, the pattern starts to decay, and then eventually it will disappear. Uh, another thing that happens here is exactly what happened with Matilde and Olivia before. So the communication of the two parts of the network between these two children is actually cut. They cannot communicate. The thing is that our complex rule here has a little technique inbuilt uh, inside of it to make sure that this doesn't stay on forever like this. So eventually it gets broken. And another thing that happens is that the I don't know pattern uh, st starts having enough blue kids on this side and interacts with this pink thing and then creates this other pattern that is, I believe uh, we're pink. It doesn't last very long. And then another collision between pink kids and blue kids generates a last, I don't know, pattern that dissipates very fast. And then we converge to what we wanted, which is uh, all the kids are blue. OK? So next thing. Work. So one of the things that we, we want to, to study in complex systems is, is how resilient the network is to perturbations. What happens if at the beginning something goes wrong? Okay, so we're going to kind of simulate what happens here if Hector, who is here, is having a tantrum. He's very small, and he's kind of like, I don't know if I want to play this game. Cards down. He's not doing anything. So we don't know if the network is actually going to be able to, ha to handle that, to deal with it. If we allow the dynamics to unfold, what happens is that in the next turn of the game, Matilde is not quite sure what to do, so she puts both cards down. Okay, but after that, the information that is present in the network after one turn of the game is sufficient for, the, for them to figure out uh, what's going on. And the network actually recovers quite nicely. And we end up with our blue, all blue pattern that we are look, looking for. But then, if instead of Hector, we have Anna only thinking about ha having some chocolate, and then she's not putting any cards up, she doesn't know what to do, uh, we want to see what the effect of that in the dynamics of the network is. Disastrous. So yeah, in the context of this initial arrangement, Anna has a lot of power to control the destiny of this network. Okay? If, she, if she's not doing anything, in the next turn of the game, she won't know either. And for quite a while, she won't know what to do. And then this don't know what to do will propagate. Then it will propagate, create a whole disaster. And then in the end, everyone is cards down, which is quite bad. Okay. Okay, so. 
Uh, this was just to illustrate a few concepts. The first one was self-organization. So this is the ability of through neighboring connections being able to speak to the whole network when necessary. Sometimes self-organization has to be cut. If you have the spread of a disease in a network, you don't want the high ability of everything to communicate and everyone to get sick. But sometimes you also need to allow the network to communicate and, and synchronize to do a, a task like the task we have at hand. Uh, we have this issue of non-linearity, and this is about, like, if I give you an arrangement of kids at, at say, after 10 turns of the game, uh, and I tell you, okay, try to work backwards what, how these kids ended up in this uh, arrangement of, of cards being shown, um, you won't be able to do it, I won't be able to do it, because there are actually many, many histories that could lead to that pattern uh, emerging, and it, this means that we cannot sort of uh, reverse engineer the system. We cannot break it down into parts because the, the interactions form nonlinear patterns that we cannot uh, undo afterwards. Then we have the, this, this notion of the mesoscopic pattern. We saw three. We saw all pinks, all blues. We saw checkerboard. And we also saw how these patterns actually interact to solve a task for a network. And finally, we saw this issue of the, what some people call the butterfly effect, which is this tantrum or the chocolate thing. Sometimes the flapping of a, of a, of a wing of a butterfly very far away can cause uh, supposedly a hurricane somewhere very distant. Okay? So you might be wondering, um, are these things about the patterns and the local interactions and the space have anything to do with the real world? Do we see this in real life? So there are many examples I could give you. One that I'm working on at the moment is actually trying to figure out how we can design processors for, com processors for computers that instead of having just one single processor that produces a lot of heat and is very difficult to design because it has tiny, tiny little pieces, we could instead have an, uh, an array, an, a big array of very cheap, not very heat producing processors that can do the job and have a lot more power. But another example comes from pattern formation in nature. So I'm just going to show you a video in which you will see um, images of uh, wings of butterflies, but also images of the genes that actually produce those patterns. And you'll see how these genes look actually like these people playing car, uh, car games. So I'm going to just play that video now. see here, this is gene expression uh, pictures. Some are simulated, some are real. Genes are responsible not only for the formation of patterns, they are responsible for the wing itself. As you can see, there is a clear spatial-temporal dynamics going on where different genes are being expressed in different places, and those will define the locations of the eye spots in the, in the wings of the butterfly. And you will see that in a minute emerging. how they appear at the divisions where these two areas communicate. We are of course also interested in how the environment affects this, this uh, emergence of these patterns. So for example in this butterfly that you're seeing here, 
uh, the temperature in which the butterfly uh, grows is very, very important. The, the hotter it is, the bigger you will see that the golden area of the ice pot grows. And, and we're trying to actually map out how, what, what is the effect of temperature on what genes and how that results in a different uh, pattern being formed. Okay? And that's it. Thank you.